Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for our Tuesday edition of Table Talk. Looks like we are live. That's what the camera is telling me anyway. So glad again to have you with us, whether you're joining me uh, live right now on Tuesday afternoon at 3.30 or whether you're picking this up a little later in the week. Uh, we appreciate all of you that join in whenever, you, whenever it is that you uh, take part in our Table Talks. I'm finishing up today. The Gospel Comes with a House Key, and uh, it's a great book by Rosaria Butterfield. We've been going through chapter by chapter, week by week, and this week brings us to the conclusion. And this will indeed be the last week that we are doing these kind of uh, daily table talks. We're uh, going to announce to you shortly what we're moving toward. We'll be uh, maintaining our Friday table talk, and then we'll do some other things during the week uh, to keep you connected with uh, our ministry and uh, to encourage you on a daily basis. Rosaria writes a conclusion and she subtitles it, Feeding the 5,000. So I want to take a, a moment to read a little bit, as I typically do, make a few observations, as I typically do, but then a couple of closing comments as well to hopefully encourage you in your hospitality. Well, she starts this chapter I think really effectively, and I'm just going to read from the start of it on page 209 if you're following with me. She writes, Radically ordinary hospitality sees our Christian homes as hospitals and incubators. We gather in the spiritually poor, crippled, blind, and broken because we have been there and not so long ago. I'm going to make a comment about that if you're wondering about who are the spiritually poor, crippled, blind in my life? That's a really good question, and we'll come back to that. We know the contours and seductions of our former atheism. We are capable of any and all evil, and we know that. Our choice temptations still know our names and addresses. We are weak. We come to Christ with nothing. We bring nothing useful for our own salvation. We are rendered lame by sin. We are unable to see God's truth on our own terms. We need God to come to us, to rescue us, because we can't summon the strength to save ourselves, and even if we could, we would not know where to go. And this is what Jesus Christ did and does. Through union with and growth in Christ, we are made new. We are redeemed, forgiven, and embraced, and, as, and adopted as children of God. We are called to die to ourselves and to our choice sins, even those that have been our kind company for as long as we can remember. We are called to repent of the original sin that distorts us, the actual sin that distracts us, and the indwelling sin that manipulates us. This is a high and hard calling. We are given supernatural power to love the things God loves and eschew those things he hates. We do not barter with the Bible on these matters, and as we walk with Christ, he renews us and restores us so that we have plenty to give to others. And if you are wondering, when are we going to get to the hospitality part? Well, there is the big key, isn't it? It is so important to remind ourselves, to renew ourselves in and by the gospel, but to constantly remind ourselves of the gospel necessity for our life. We owe our life to Christ. We owe our spiritual life to Christ. We owe our very life, of course, to God who grants us breath on a daily basis. And it's only by living in the gospel in that way in a thankfulness, in a mindfulness of what the gospel has meant to us, that we're also then mindful of the necessity to serve others and the ability to serve others because God has served us. So do you see now, I hope you see now the importance then, I think this is a great introduction to our conclusion because it really sets the foundation for a hospitable life. You know, you're not going to be hospitable because you're a nice person. Now, some of us might be, by personality, a little more inclined toward hospitality than others, or even inclined more toward niceness than others. But niceness isn't the point. 
you're going to be driven more toward hospitality than you naturally are the more you remind yourself of the gospel necessity in the gospel's necessity in your own life remember where you came from and think about where you are now and the riches that you have in Christ and that ought to then inculcate in us a longing a desire a motivation and a fuel to serve others and to serve others the very same gospel that we've been so blessed by so she goes on and says Christians are not fearful hoarders we are fearless givers Psalm 112 tells us why the righteous will never be moved he will be remembered forever he is not afraid of bad news his heart is firm trusting in the Lord that's the key trusting in the Lord radically ordinary hospitality manifests confident trust that the Lord will care for us and that he will care for others through our obedience but how does God multiply the fishes and the loaves how does he feed the 5,000? How does he use us? Well, all Christians are called to practice hospitality in their homes. Households run by single Christians are just as vital, necessary, and needed in the practice of hospitality as those run by married people. Households without children and households with children each model Christ's blessings. The redeemed rich and the redeemed poor and everyone in between are called to practice Christian hospitality in households, dorm rooms, bus stops, and community gardens. I really, really like that. And, you know, the book is, is not without its critics and criticisms. I haven't focused on that uh, because, one, I just don't think it's helpful and it's so easy then to, to dialogue it, or to not dialogue with an author that we find challenging. To not allow hard things to rest on our hearts a little bit and for a little while and, and to really wrestle. You know, this, what she calls radical ordinary hospitality is really emphasizing the radical, as, we've, as I've mentioned before, rather than the ordinary. And yet that's also not fair because, you know, she... In her conclusion, even I won't have time to read it all, she reminds of how ordinary even her radical hospitality is. Uh, for instance, you know, too often we get stuck um, not doing hospitality because of some standard that we feel we've got to meet, some standard of care for our guests. I'll remind you that hospitality means loving the stranger loving the stranger well i i think I, I recall asking you this to consider who are the strangers you know quote unquote strangers in your life and how would you love them and if you could answer those two questions you'd be a long way towards serving those around you whom god has called you to serve in a gospel-centered hospital hospitable way I said we'd go back to that opening sentence, second sentence, sorry, when she said, we gather in the spiritually poor, crippled, blind, and broken because we have been there. I think that's maybe a little bit of a stumbling block to us. And, you know, as I've read through this, I've read some really, in a way, in the true sense of the word fantastic, fantastic stories. How many of us have ever had a meth lab right next door and where you see the DEA coming in and busting your neighbor and his girlfriend for the activities within their home, the home right next to you. Well, probably most of us have not experienced that. And of course, we live in a town that is pretty relentlessly middle class and very aspirational. It's aspirational in terms of how we keep our gardens and wash our cars and we keep our homes updated and there's a real in a way a keeping up with the Joneses in our community it's by 
you know, maybe not by Canadian standards, but certainly by global standards, we're highly affluent. And even by Canadian standards, I'd say that we're on the affluent side of things. And so we may feel a little bit distanced from some of her stories. And you may wonder, is it easier maybe for her to do hospitality in that context where the needs seem so great? But I want to say to you that all of our community needs Christ. All of our community does. And so when she says we gather in the spiritually poor, well, we could say, yes, when we ourselves were spiritually poor when we did not know Christ. The crippled, the blind, and the broken, yeah, we, we probably have to look at that a little more metaphorically rather than literally. But, you know, we have gone door to door, for instance, uh, three or four times over the years, uh, generally around Christmas. And when we ask people things that we can pray for, you know, we find some, sometimes some really desperate situations, people that live right in our community. And then we find lots of just regular situations that normal families go through, family fracture and difficulties and people that are really hurting. And so even though we don't have you know, the meth lab perhaps cooking next door, that doesn't mean you've got, that you don't have people that desperately need the gospel truths that we sadly sometimes take for granted. So a good reminder, she opens up this conclusion by reminding us of basic gospel truths and encouraging us, I think, to have them in mind because that will motivate and fuel our, our desire and even, I think, the quality of our hospitality. And I think, you know, one of the criticisms against her has been that it's, um, that she's drawing maybe too much attention to herself through her stories and, and that it paints a picture that this is the way hospitality must be. That's not the impression I have. When I've gone through this book, I don't feel condemned because I don't, do things as often or in the same way Rosaria does them. I've tried to, to, as I read through it, really give consideration to it and try to, what are the takeaways? And, you know, in this stage in my life, I, I don't think I, I would be doing things exactly like Rosaria does them. If you're a young family, you know, you've got three or four children under the age of six or seven, there's a really good chance you won't have the space to do everyday hospitality in exactly the same way Rosaria does. But what I want you to do as your pastor is for you to really think through these things carefully and, and up, apply the learnings to your life and your situation and to allow the Lord to, to grow you in your hospitality so that um, next half year from now, you will be more effective in how you love your neighbor, how you love the stranger. Can you do that? And, and it doesn't have to look exactly like Rosaria. I've never said that it needs to. Uh, I think she raises such wonderful points of consideration here, though, that are really, it's good for us to be challenged. And it's good for us to be challenged in terms of how we see others and how we can serve others best. Uh, in the rest of the conclusion here, she speaks about um, a, few, a few things, and I'll just quickly mention some of them. One would be boundaries. So it's really important, especially for married couples, to be on the same page. And, uh, you know, she talks about allowing the, the weaker, if you will, the weaker of the spouses uh, to set the pace in a way. So, so if one is especially given to hospitality and, and the other one a little less, then you're probably going to go with the pacing of the little bit less, at least to start with, so that this hospitality is not meant to drive a wedge between couples or in families. She talks about schedules as well. And, and uh, the necessity of making room for hospitality in your life. And here's where I want to qualify that. And I think she does a pretty good job of this as well um, through the book. 
when I say make room for it, yes, I guess I do literally mean to make room for it, but not as it were as some extra event. Okay, hospitality is not an event or a performance. It's to be a habit. It's to be a lifestyle. When we treat it as some kind of monumental event that I've got to gird myself up for to do once a month just because I, I ought to do it, that's not really the point of this book, and it's I don't think that's the point of the Bible either. Hospitality is to be a habit. It's to be a disposition of our soul to love our neighbors and to love our strangers, to love the stranger. And so see hospitality as a habit. Now, yeah, there are practical considerations, like if you right now could say to me, Pastor Gary, if you sat me down, looked me eye to eye, and, and we went over a daytimer together, you're going to see I have no room, not even on a once a week basis, to be hospitable to a neighbor or a friend. Well, then we're going to talk about your priorities in life, and that's how I'm going to challenge you this, to look at that schedule and make room for it somehow. On Sunday, I talked about how we make room with our time, with our, with our, uh, our treasure, our money, with our energy, for those things that we delight in. And so if we start to delight in serving others, you'll make room for it as well. Uh, she talks about what a typical day looks like, and, and our typical days don't look like Rosaria's, I'll just say that, but we can still learn from her typical days. Uh, one aspect is just preparing to be hospitable. Here's a minor way in which, which I did that yesterday. Uh, you know, I was making muffins. I've got a garden in my, in my backyard and had a couple of large zucchini, so I was going to do some baking on my day off. Uh, some muffins, and I made a load of muffins. I, it's only Linda and myself at home, and I made uh, two and a half dozen muffins. I knew I was seeing a friend that day, so I said, that's a great opportunity to bless my, my widower friend. And, um, and then just after dinner, I heard uh, a young family that I've been getting to know on the street. They're fairly recently moved onto Mill Street, where I live, and, and there are a few houses down, and I've been getting to know uh, the family, the kids and, and the parents. And so I heard the parents chatting with my next door neighbor. I said, here's a great opportunity. I've got muffins ready made, so I, I brought them out to them. And that was just a little way of being hospitable. It's not really gospel hospitality, so to speak. It's not, you know, that sharing of life and that opening up and, and tending to wounds and all those things. But it is establishing contact. It's It's a kindness. It's it's continuing a conversation that I've already got going with both of these families. And it's just doing something nice. And that's okay. And it's, it's really good, actually, to do that from time to time. It, it opens doors of relationship. And, uh, and it's just human. It's, it's just something that we ought to be doing uh, for each other. So that's just a little way of uh, reaching out. She also says, she talks about her home being a beautiful mess. <laughs> Our home is a beautiful, messy blessing to us. We use it for many, many things. It's where we work and where we care for people. And I thought that was a really good description and a good objective uh, for us. Could we make our homes a place that cares for people? And, uh, I, you know, I, I've challenged some of you over the years to, to try to see hospitality way beyond a performance. Some of you are held back from being hospitable because you think too much in performance terms. And if my house isn't perfect, I can't, uh, I can't invite somebody in. If I don't have matching china, I can't hide, uh, invite somebody in. Well, we, Rosaria is really good at that. And she talks about her mismatched uh, silverware and flatware and, and how simple her meals are, because that's not the point. And as much as it's nice to do those kinds of meals, and I do them from time to time for people where I lay everything out, the nice tablecloth and all that, it's fun. But I never want to be held back from serving somebody when it's in my power to do so because there are dust bunnies underneath the chairs or a cobweb in the corner or I can't put out a three-part meal. Let's never be held back from hospitality because of that. All right, uh, where do we want to go from here? I think um, there are a few other things I wanted to say, but I'm already 
at my time limit really for today. Uh, how I want to encourage you is, I guess, to see hospitality as, as way beyond personality and gifting. See it as a calling to all of us, as Rosaria said in the introduction. If you struggle in that way, um, she really speaks to that in this chapter. If you struggle because you're maybe profoundly introverted and, and you've placated yourself really with that as an excuse. You've said, well, that I've got other gifts that I can offer. And that's so true. Of course you can. But being an introvert doesn't keep you from being hospitable. In fact, Rosaria is an introvert. And she gives really good advice as to how she allows the Lord to serve her in quiet times. She makes sure she has that every day. She creates space where she can be fed by the Lord and His Spirit and His Word. And that fuels her then for the day when she's got a stretch. She's got a stretch to, to spend time with people. And she found, she has found the Lord to be so faithful. So let's not limit ourselves because of personality. She also addresses things like uh, capability and capacity, either the size of your home or the size of your table settings, the number of them. None of that is an excuse not to serve people. All right, hospitality is again, it's a habit, and it is simply loving the stranger. And so let's ask the Lord and continue to seek the Lord. How can we grow in this way of living our lives in a way that displays the gospel before those whom we love and who also need that very same gospel? Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, these times. I've really enjoyed going through this book. It's a little bit different than just doing uh, a Bible study, and, and I think it's been quite nice. And uh, again, highly commend the book. I had a congregant just this past week say they they purchased the book. It's been hard just to go chapter by chapter because they've really enjoyed it, and and I uh, really got encouraged by it because they said, in spite of the fact, uh, you know, it's it's challenging on many fronts. I'm really learning how to apply this in my own life, and that's the goal. Well, goodbye for now. I sure do love you, and tune in tomorrow when uh, Pastor Andrew continues his work in the Psalms. Bye for now.